you know, we could have a whole podcast on the topic of credibility and how important it is. Um, but it is, if, if you, if you do make a misstep or say something that undermines your credibility, you know, you've really jeopardized your case. Um, and it's, it, it is true. And it's, I think the first and one of the most powerful times that you have to start building that credibility is in jury selection. And, and that little exchange of getting to, is happening every, ever since I started using this, every kind of like thing, it's happened every time where I ask that the court excuse somebody who would be biased for my client. Mm -hmm. And I think it empowers the people who might have feelings of strong opinions for the doctor in the hospital to start talking. They'll start telling you. Right. Or more um, honestly, how they feel. If they see that you're willing, you really are kind of looking for a fair fight. Talk to me more about the fair fight. I haven't, I haven't used that before. When I think of um, some of the more valuable contributions that Nick's made, I think of, um, you know, the, the brutal honesty yes. construct where you, you kind of start with that theme with the jury and look, we're, do you know what brutal honesty means? What does it mean? And we, we need you to be brutally honest with us and get commitments that they are. And that theme, which is so, um, effective as that carries forward throughout the entire trial. And you can ask expert witnesses. All right, now you let's be brutally brutal. honest. I love that. You know, you're, you're, you're pretty much a hundred percent on the side of the doctors, no matter what, you know, whatever it is. But, um, uh, tell me more about this. So the fair fight, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, that we're just looking for a juror who's going to be, who's not going to have opinions or feelings that will drive a decision or fair evaluation of the evidence. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, what are the, in your mind, what are the essential uh, questions that you need to ask in a medical malpractice jury trial, trial selection? What do you, and, and give us some examples of the questions that you would, that you ask in your medical cases. I always ask questions about if you have, have strong feelings one way or the other about medical care providers or hospitals, anyone, usually that is in the questionnaire. So we have a sense of that, but you still have to ask it because sometimes people do, you know, mindlessly put this stuff down as they know or check a box. So I usually ask if anybody has, um, if there's a specific medical issue involved if anybody has experience with that like if it's a nerve injury case or if anybody has a, a baby who was born with significant disabilities or things like or, or with themselves their family members or close friends it's usually how i would say it does anybody here have an ex has anybody here had a bad experience like an, i had a phlebotomy case with a blood draw and you know is anybody, does anybody here, you know, has anybody here had diverticulitis and have experience with diverticulitis one way or the other? So you want to know if they have specialized knowledge or, or personal experiences with the, the issues that they're going to be learning about. So what do you do with that knowledge if somebody has had a personal experience similar to your client? Say they've had a you know, that they're a cancer survivor and the, can the case involves a misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis of cancer. I mean, what do you do with that information? Well, I'll say is, is are you going to be able to fairly evalu evaluate this evidence without, uh, as, as fairly as you can, because I would use fairly then, because then they're going to want to say, yes, of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> fairly, if it was something on the opposite, like I had kids that was picked up right away, it was great treatment, you know, whatever, then I might use different language to use that. But in your, your scenario, I would say, are you going to be able to fairly look at this evidence and put aside your personal experiences? Because the court is going to tell you, you can't, you're going to be instructed on the light, you can't bring you have your personal experiences you can bring, but you can't bring outside knowledge that you have to learn about in the courtroom. Would that be hard for you? And so for some people, it would be hard. Others may not. How would that affect you? Well, and, and you, you've, you've touched on something really important, the, the idea of, of specialized knowledge, because obviously jurors can show up, whether they can be, a, it can be a physician, it could be a nurse, it could be uh, an insurance professional. I mean, you don't know who's going to show up, 
but uh, Georgia has an interesting rule. Uh, it's been uh, it's been changed fairly recently, uh, but the rule was that if you showed up on the jury and you did have specialized knowledge uh, relevant to the to the um, case, that you could still serve on the jury, but you as a juror was subject to cross examination yourself in the trial. So, what? so they would pull a jury. Yeah. Well, that used to be the law in Georgia, and and I believe it arose out of the smaller communities where there might be a dispute that everybody in town knows about. Um, and right. they can get jurors if you're trying to find people who know nothing about the car wreck that happened down on Main and First or whatever it was. But uh, but now specialized knowledge is a grounds for, for a strike, a causal strike, because you don't want a person back on the jury who is going to basically be testifying during jury uh, during jury deliberations. Right. Um, and in medical and cases, that's yeah, it's a big particularly deal. problematic, right? Because you don't know what they're going to say and it's not black and white. And so you definitely, I mean, we get, we actually get a lot of doctors and nurses who show up in our panels. I don't know sure. if that happens in Georgia. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, I think probably most people who are to our work would be like, oh, that, that's scary. You don't want them talking. But in a way, you can always use it to to help whatever your cause is. If you're, I think, betrayed enough and in, in saying things like, I, you know, if you have somebody who says, who's a doctor, and you know you're going to want to bump them, what is that? Like, that's one person you know you're going to want to bump. Um, and you start asking questions about your, their, you, you're going to be told that the only evidence that you can consider in this case is what you hear in this courtroom, but you have all this knowledge about how to look at x-rays and how, when to order blood tests and what blood tests mean that might, you might not hear in this courtroom. Will you be able to say back in the jury, not bring any of that up and not only not bring it up, but not let it affect how you're thinking about the evidence? They're always going to say, I mean, if they're being on, uh, they're, well, first of all, doctors never want to be on the jury because they, they don't want to spend that time, but sure. they're going to say that would be very hard for me. And and I think it educates the judge in a way too. Like we get in these myopic ways of doing our work where we think judges understand the, you know, the things that we're doing and the different perspectives they're going ultimately going to be the ones that make the decision about whether or not this is a proper juror for the case. And if, and they will try these bug words, like I could be fair, I could be unbiased. Can you set that aside? Yes. But if you start to tell them things like that through the questions you're asking and they realize, oh yeah, that would be bad if they get back there and you start finding about some study you read that wasn't talked about, you know what I mean? Sure, sure. And, and there's so much, there's so much psychology involved. Um, and I, I, I was at a, uh, uh, participating in a, in a class session at one of the local law schools here as a guest of the professor to come in and talk about jury selection. And, uh, but we did, and we did a mock trial with the, with the students. And it was, if we had pulled in a, a, a group of random folks from Fulton County, there was as much diversity, even among this, this panel of, uh, Emory university law students as there would be in, in pulling from all of Metro Atlanta and people had as, diverse of views and, and feelings about you know, the issues in the case that we were talking about. Um, it, it, every, everybody is, it, I'm always fascinated by this, but everybody is, is to, typically defies what you expect when you first meet them. And we're, we're so used to having, well, you know, you're a doctor, you're going to feel this way, or you're a, an insurance adjuster or a banker or construction worker. And you just can't know until you have the opportunity to talk to people. Um, so. It's so true. And I think that is one of the things, at least in the beginning of my career, you'd think, okay, what's the perfect juror for this case? If you just get into that mindset going into it, you can sometimes miss or not take advantage of finding out about things you need to know that you wouldn't have expected. Like the juror who seems bad on paper, but it is actually good, or the juror who seems good on paper, but it's actually probably not going to be good. So right. you, I think you really, really have to, and it is, I think, impossible to do by yourself. I mean, I know that I, 
I've had a jury consultant never pick a jury. I know you've probably done that, but just help you um, sort of craft how you're going to go about maybe identifying certain people. I've used John Campbell and Alicia Campbell. Their big data that's been helpful. But that's the kind of thing too. Sometimes where the demographics can be deceiving. Um, I, I try to remind myself, like you think. There's going to be a perfect juror. Like, and I guess, like in a medical malpractice case, somebody who um, who's had a bad experience and lost a loved one because of a bad experience, like, okay, that's going to be the greatest juror ever. But then, if you don't, if you start talking to them and they say, you know, we didn't, we didn't sue because we didn't think it was going to make any difference, right? And right. then, then the perfect juror all of a sudden is somebody who is. Actually, and that's a that's a neuropsychological known fact that people can can do that. They they have that life experience, and they have, but at the same time, they you know they've changed. It's it's not the way you expect it to be because their way of dealing with it is different. Well, it, it took me a while to appreciate that that precise point you're making. That you think, well, this this juror has had a very similar. Uh, experience or hardship as the plaintiff, they will identify with the plaintiff. They will right. be sympathetic. They will be open to their story. And my experience is the complete opposite for the reasons you're talking about. Well, I had a you know a bad knee injury, but with with surgery and pins and rods and screws and all the rest, and you know I I got through it okay. I didn't sue anybody. Um, you know, and any and then that person becomes more judgmental. Um, over the plaintiff and it's like, mm -hmm. well, why aren't you as strong as I perceive myself as being? It, it's very interesting psychology. I, as a typical rule, I'll try not to, I don't want people who've um, had similar experiences right. as the plaintiff. I think about the, um, that horrible uh, football um, uh, injury of Joe Theismann back in the day where his leg got torn up, the quarterback got hit and his leg was broken in all different directions and they played it on TV you know, day after day after day is horrible. And um, I've never played football, never had my knees torn up um, by a broken bone, fortunately. But I couldn't watch that because just imagining it was so horrible. But I think if I'd been through something similar, you know, it'd still be horrible, but it wouldn't I'd have a different relationship to the information. It's yeah, and, I mean, it's a, they've studied this. They know that you know, for a certain percentage and probably a large percentage, I don't know, the, I don't remember it specifically, that sort of life experience, even like in use of force cases or things like that, it's, and I can't remember what the psychological term is, but it is a, it is something people do normally in, in that it's, you know, when they are going to look for reasons to distinguish themselves from the person who's in front of them, the us, them thing. And right. even when it seems like they would understand because of their life experience. I, and I've, I've heard it described as a protective mechanism. It's a, it's a subconscious bias where, uh, say, and we see this in cases where um, you know, a child has been injured, we're representing the child. Well, a lot of focused jurors that we put the case in front of, well, their, their mind immediately goes to blame the mom. Yep. Well, where's the mother? You know, why wasn't the mother in the child's? bedroom and when when the child like crazy, had this, crazy right. you have never anticipated anybody would ever say yeah but but it, what, I, what i came to appreciate is that it's not any malice or bad faith That's it's right. it's it's i have to think that because i'm a mother you know i have to think that i am safe from this horrible thing happening yes. to my child it's just too unbearable to imagine something like this happening. So it couldn't happen to me. It could not happen to me. Because I would have done things differently to prevent it. Well, how do you find those, it could not happen to me jurors and identify them for jury selection? How do you find those folks? Well, if they have this, if, if there's that, if there's some indication that they have an experience similar, I definitely talk to them. And I, and I say, look, so I, I'm honest, brutal honesty. I say that too, brutal honesty. Yeah. There's some people who might be say that I had this experience. It was so horrible. I, I, I feel sympathy for you and there's no place for sympathy here. I make sure I bring that up in jury selection. 
often more than once. There's no place for sympathy here. The judge is gonna tell you that in the instructions. We don't want your sympathy. And you can't have sympathy for the doctor either. It's not allowed in the courtroom. And so some if it if these this is some people who've had this experience are gonna have sympathy because of the similarity of their experience with my client. Other people might say, well, that wouldn't have happened in my situation because I would have done things differently. I wouldn't have be this couldn't have happened or I wouldn't be, I'd go back to work. I did go back to work, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever the scenario is actually. Both of those are, are people who probably wouldn't be good on this jury. So I'm afraid that because of your own personal life experience, you might be one of those. Should I be a great? I say that. Should I be afraid of you as a juror? For Should I be them? afraid of you? I That's an that. interesting question. I've never heard that before. Yes, I is the answer I, ever? I, yes, you should. Run I, be I, very I, afraid. They do say that. Yeah. And I said to them, if you were me, would you be afraid of having someone like you on my jury? I've heard it. That's such a great question. And I've, I've, I've asked it. I'm sure I took this from somebody somewhere. But I've asked a similar question. I'll say, well, you know, Mr. Johnson or Ms. Smith, um, let me ask you a question. If you were sitting over here where my client is sitting, um, facing a trial and, uh, involving very serious issues of medical uh, negligence and catastrophic injury, would, knowing yourself as well as you do, would you want you sitting mm -hmm. on that jury? And it's, That's you know, a good question. It's, it's a good question. Sometimes people, you know, the defense will object you know, for no good reason, but they just don't like the question. Um, yeah. But it's introspective. And, and sometimes jurors will be like, well, you know, you really don't want me on this jury. You know, I, I just have had this experience. Of, I just feel so strongly. And people will, you know, they'll say it sometimes just to get out of jury selection. They do. And you, but you don't want them either. That's true. You know, if they're willing to do that. You don't want them want because what they're doing, even if they don't think it, they're not being honest. And you certainly want to try to find somebody who's honest and I, who wants to do the right thing. One thing I've seen, I'm, I'm curious if you've seen this too, is where you have a visibly very severely injured person, maybe somebody in a wheelchair, or, you know, really clearly bad shape. Um, and the defense will try and uh, identify people who have big hearts and who are just naturally empathetic yes. people so they can strike them all for cause. And I've seen that happen in several trials. And we'll, we, we, we talk about sympathy a little bit differently. We say it's okay to feel a deep well of sympathy. We're all human beings. Of course, you're going to feel sympathy. Um, how could you not? But what you can't do is base your decision on that. Um, and that's a good way to say, I, I say, I make the distinction between empathy and sympathy. Yeah. What, what do you see as the so, distinction in your mind? I, well, what I say, I'll ask them, what does it mean to you sometimes? Or I'll say, the court's going to talk to you about sympathy, that you can't base a decision on sympathy. Then we don't want your sympathy. That doesn't mean you're not going to feel for both sides. I try to make it both sides. Yeah, very smart. I try to be very, you know, and equal about it because you're going to have people who do feel sympathy for that doctor sitting sure. there. But it's more inclusive and it's, it doesn't mean you're not, you're going to feel for the position that this family is in for the rest of the, this child's life or the, or fears about what this will do to this doctor. Those are all appropriate ideas and feelings that we have, but you can't let that overshadow the evidence. Yeah. So you can't use that as a reason to find for my client or the doctor, you know? And so that's, so, but I, I make it because they think uh, the reason that I think it's important to bring that sympathy and say sympathy and that we aren't looking for sympathy. That's not why we're here. is because they all think you are. And right. think you're there trying to manipulate them into, and then so it's, it, really important if you're doing it a pan in a panel to bring it up first because you get to go first so take advantage of what you get Absolutely. bring it up in front of the defenses because they it takes they always talk about that like you said 
you know, they'll get up and go on and on about, does anybody here feel terribly for this? Or, you know, you're going to see this child and the, you know, blah, 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 and or this, you know, whatever the injury is, they lost their, their wife or mother and that's horrible and that kind of thing. But if you take it away from them, because they're trying to, they, the way it's usually portrayed is like, we're going to try to explain that or sympathy. So you've already taken it away. You just think, I'm well, not trying to get your sympathy. Right. And they're going off so much by what they've seen on TV. And of course, uh, there's some, there's some great uh, legal movies and TV shows, but, but, it's, but it's an environment where they have to be uh, more over the top. It's less accurate. Yeah. Most of them are, there, there's some really good ones, but uh uh, but people are being informed by what they see on TV or, or how they perceive it to be. And they don't, um, they don't see that. And they're kind of like, wait, this is different. Um, you're just going to try to maybe cry. So then I'll give you a lot of money. Yeah. It's like, well, not exactly. We're going to try and help you understand the case and the law and reach a just verdict as we see it. And the defense will see it very differently, usually. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think it's really important as the plaintiff to say, we don't want your sympathy. Yeah, that's not that's not why we're here. This is not about that. And David um, Ball has a nice line. He says, um, uh, he, he he says, uh, you know, we don't we're not asking for your sympathy. The time for sympathy is long past. Yeah, that's we're asking great. you for justice. That's great. That's strong. Like yeah, that. again, right. you know, inspired by the by the great David Ball and others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I like that. And and I do, you know, I think it's really like one of the worst in a panel, one of the worst answers, you know, when you tell them you want brutal honesty and then they are brutally honest, you got to take it, right? And sure. I have this juror say, well, this, I, I didn't realize that this was going to be such a, such theater or such state, you know, like so pretend and, you know, something like that like when i was asking the questions and so it was like he's basically saying you're full of shit you're acting right now you know oh, man, this is a pg oh, rated uh podcast no, i was kidding you're, you're, and you're acting and and i had this data and look i get it because this is totally artificial everything about this is artificial and i understand that that's what it seems like but it isn't we really need to know beyond how you feel about this process how you feel about these issues. So just try to redirect it back to that. It, or maybe that how you feel about that means you can't sit on this jury because you feel like everything we're saying is just pretend or acting. Mm -hmm. Is that how you feel? You know, and so you give them. Well, and, and people will, you know, you give them permission to be brutally honest and they kind of like, okay, you want it, you got it. And then they tell you things they may not otherwise, but that's, that's a gift. I mean, you, you, you want the person to look you in the face and say, you know, I despise you and, and lawyers and yes. you know, I, there's, there are not enough lawyer jokes to, to satisfy me. And I, I wish you'd all, you know, go fly away somewhere. I mean, you want that person to reveal themselves. What you don't want them to do is end up on a jury and not have disclosed that. So right. you know, somebody with an agenda who, and the agenda is not to, you know, to do the right thing. The agenda is to get you. I mean. I'm being a little bit over the top, maybe, but not really. I've seen jurors who've had yeah. those strong feelings. You probably have to. Absolutely. And the most, I mean, it's not just to medical practice, it's any plaintiff's case, but you have to talk to them about giving money for you know, pain and suffering and emotional distress. And, and I try to spend as much time as I can on that because while you can ask specific questions about how they feel related to medical care or institutions, that question, I think, would be revealing on, on as to their deep feelings or potential strong opinions about lawsuits in general, and so that will overshadow everything. And and the, and it's great when a juror will tell you, "I don't think you should give money for pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to make any difference. I don't think when you lost, uh, when someone dies, a lawsuit should be brought because a person is never going to." Money's not going to bring that person back. All those kind of questions, those kind of answers that are really honest, you're trying to get for sure, because that's the thing that will most tell you is this somebody who's going to come to this evidence with blinders. Yeah, I think these are great points. And, and one of the sort of 
recurring themes I've noticed in your, as you're talking about jury selection is, is just being honest with the jury about what you're doing, why you're doing it and not look like you're a so-called slick lawyer. Mm -hmm. You got some secret agenda, you know, it's just, this is it. We, we need a fair jury. And, uh, I used to joke way back when say, well, I don't really want a fair jury. I want a jury that sees it my way completely. Well, it's kind of a joke and I don't believe that anymore because uh, you, that creates all kinds of problems. If you have people on there who are biased in your favor, all of a sudden you may be trying the case again because there's a mistrial. Um, I, and it's, and it's all about building your credibility, you know, because I think like what you were talking about before about the defense counsel, like they're always trying to pre preview the facts in a way that has some, you know, goofy little, how do you, feel about memory and is it like things like that you know or does a picture tell a thousand words you know <laughs> uh, oh, my favorite my favorite is to, just because the plaintiffs filed a lawsuit how many people think that you know she should get an award just because she filed a lawsuit yeah i mean what, what is that mean? everybody knows they answer that right i mean i know but I mean. it's like and i haven't done this before and i saw somebody doing it and i'm going to use it from now on to say this, we're not supposed. I mean, people who are listening to this may not understand. It's universally a rule: you're not supposed to be talking about the evidence in jury selection. Right. You're not across the board. You're not supposed to be trying to convince them about the evidence that they haven't heard. Prejudge the issues. You're not supposed to prejudge it. Yep. Exactly. So I'm going to start saying that. I heard actually, I was watching something that Jason Aiken did, and he did that. He's like, I really want to talk to you about the facts of the case. And because you always get that response, as you know, when you say something, a lot of times a juror will say, well, I don't know. It'll depend on what the evidence shows. Right. Right. So then you have to dig beyond that. Right. But if you prefaced it with, we can't tell you, I don't really want to tell you. The judge has told us we're not allowed to tell you about the evidence. And we, you know, you're chosen for this jury. I can't wait to tell you about this. Episode. Well, you're also creating some drama and some suspense. Yeah, it is. It's, it's like, boy, well, you really want to be on this jury. You need me on this jury. <laughs> yeah, it is. And then it also does that that thing of the distinction between the two sides because they will get up and start doing that. Yeah. Undeniably, they will get up and start trying to ask questions to get at some issue in the evidence that And the contrast is is so stark. I mean, when you when you have a, a an honest voir dire process where you're are truly seeking to understand who the jury is, so you can use your peremptory strikes intelligently versus the conditioning and the leading questions. And, and typically the jury will just sit there and stare because uh, they know what's going on. Juries are much smarter than, um, than they may be portrayed in popular culture. Cause I mean, juries, once they're on my experiences, but once they're on that jury, once they've taken the oath and they, are, they settle in 99 times out of a hundred, they're trying hard to get the right answer, which is what you want. Yeah, if you've done your job right and thinking them for sure. Yeah. And yeah. it's just such an amazing, I mean, even when they do, when I disagree and you come in second, as you said, <laughs> it, it's such an amazing process. It's really, I, I think if you bring that belief and awe to what they are going to do or agreeing to do, they'll, they'll sense that from you. They'll right. sense that. And, and it's really important that they understand how important this job is. Sure, sure. And then I, I, and the last thing I want to ask you about is, if, have you had chances to talk to jurors after a trial and and hear their experience? Yes, I mean, it's so surprising to me that even those people who didn't want to be, you know, or the reluctant juror and the reluctant hero, you know, the judge will say things like even not even after the case, but we can go longer. Um, but I know that some of the jurors have a problem and they're like, oh no, we'll, we'll change our schedules. We'll like, I know. You know, I know. You're so grateful. Uh, yeah. And then afterwards, you know, they just took the time. They, they took it seriously. They just are so thankful. Mm -hmm. You know, been part of it really. They're yeah. happy about it. Yeah. Well, so, Meg, it has been so nice having you on the podcast today. We're up on the hour and I know you're, 
incredibly busy trial lawyer out in Alaska, keeping, uh, keeping your cases moving. So thank you for carving some time out for us today and discussing the issues of jury selection in Vordire. And um, I look forward to seeing you at the next Inner Circle meeting and uh, hopefully, hopefully sooner. Thanks, Floyd. Thanks for having me. It's my first podcast, so. though. Well, you, you, you nailed it. Hit it out of the ballpark. So thank you so much. Take care. Have a good day.